Hi, I am Andrew Farr. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 15 in the English Standard Version. The section tells how Jesus chose the 12 apostles. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from the twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brothers, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Escape, who became a traitor. Thank you, Andrew. Great job. Well, lots of good things going on today. You should have seen Calvin in his hat. I just, it was about the color of his shirt, and I, it looks good, so yeah, lots of good things happening last night. You'll probably see pictures coming up on Facebook. I did bring mine just in case, just so that you guys can get a little uh, taste of what actually went on last night. So it's not quite in the best shape, but this is how it went. So I appreciate the announcement about Life Tree Cafe today. We're going to be starting Life Tree Cafe on Wednesday night. And so you guys missed a lot last night if you weren't there, I'm telling you. So, but that's really an exciting thing with Life Tree Cafe. So it's, it's something that is going to be very, very different, uh, especially for me, because I think I'll start off as moderator. I'm, I'm hoping some of you will be able to do that as well. But it's a discussion class where we don't try to prove the point. Yeah, I mean, that's different. I'm used to trying to get to the point, but it's all based on audience participation. So I need people who can talk, and I need somebody there to be able to say the right opinion, because if I'm the moderator, I don't get to say it. <laughs> so somebody needs to be able to say the right opinion and put up with people who say the wrong opinion. So that's kind of how it's going to go. So I'm excited about that. It's got a lot of good things that are going on. Let me show you, I think, a clip of Life Tree Cafe. Some people seem to have all the luck. Others seem to have all the pain. Seven years ago, I lost my husband. And before that, I lost two children. And on July 22nd, I lost my home. It was struck by lightning. I sat that day of the fire and beat my fist on my steering wheel, asking why, and saying, I don't know how I'm going to do this. How do you cope when life isn't fair? After losing so many things in my life, one of the very first things while I'm sitting there watching my house burn down was I actually had a moment of excitement when I thought, I wonder what God's going to do with this. <laughs> because some of the neatest things in my life have come out of the tragedies. Enough already, when bad things keep happening. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, you saw the announcement about Leroy. He's, he's, it's not going to be tomorrow. And if we don't have your email, if you would send us your email, you'll get updates all the time of things going on. Uh, the main thing is Mission Sunday, and that's the other reason for wearing the hat. I'm going to save this for Ken. Because if you know Ken, he needs a hat like this, doesn't he? So I just think that would be the best thing for him. Next Sunday, Mission Sunday is the day when all of us come together and we raise all of the mission funds for the whole year. So for this year, that target is $65,000. So you might need to bring an extra check. So that's the goal for it. I just want you to be aware of it. I hope you've been thinking about it. Uh, you're going to get to hear about a lot of the mission stuff that already went on. So are we ready for the lesson today? 
do you think you'll pay attention if I preach in this? <laughs> Probably not, so I'll give it to the second biggest kid. Here you go, Jack. <laughs> All right, so lots of good things that are happening now. Uh, mission Sunday's coming, in, and that's just going to be a great thing because there's a whole lot of our people who have gone on mission trips, and you need to hear about some of those things as well as be ready for the plans that we have. We are not just about us. I know we've remodeled our building, and, and it looks like we're thinking about us, but we are not just about us. We go worldwide with this in a big way to a lot of different places. All right, so Luke 6, the passage Andrew read to us. I want to look at what it means to be chosen today. What is that all about? How do we do this? Here's the time when Jesus chooses his 12 apostles. And so as you look at this, Jesus spends a night in prayer first, and then he chooses his 12. Always a good thing to do before you make choices and before you decide how things ought to go. So how do you pick the right leaders? Uh, and the odd thing is he chooses normal, ordinary people. He doesn't choose the, the highest degree from the college. He doesn't choose the one who sent in the best resume. He seems to pick fishermen. He picks, that's kind of blue collar, but he also picks the other end of this. He picks the tax collector. He picks people that we're not even sure of all the jobs that they have, but they seem to be supporting fishing business around Galilee. And they seem to be, you know, people from high office, people from low office, people from all over. The one group he does not pick from is the religious leaders. Isn't that odd that he does not pick the religious leaders of his day? He gives them all kinds of titles or descriptions. And so, Simon, he says, I'm going to change your name. I'm going to call you Peter. Reasons for that. He's the rock. He's the one that, that uh, Jesus is going to depend on. Judas is the traitor or becomes the traitor, according to the passage. You look at the other Simon, and he's a zealot. Wow. Somebody political. Who are the zealots? The zealots were for the violent overthrow of Rome. And so Jesus picks his disciples not because they have the best reputation, but he picks their disciples because he thinks this ought to work. I'm going to take people that shouldn't get along, that won't get along, and I'm going to see if this actually works. I'm going to show you how it works. Because these guys don't really fit together. Have you ever been in the room that, where a guy has a definite candidate that he really believes in, that ought to win the election, and he doesn't get why everybody else isn't so excited about this? That would be Simon. I mean, he, this is a political statement. He needs to do this. He, he is all for, let's make bombs. Let's blow them up. We got to get Rome out of, out of Jerusalem. Not going to happen. Jesus picks people from all different places, just like a church, right? People from all different places, people from all over, and he says, now I want to pull you all in together. And I think one of the main things is who chooses them. He lets the fishermen know, I want you to be fishers of men. He goes to the party at the tax collector's house, and he says, this is your last party. You're going to be following me. He calls people to follow him in much different ways. And they learn about him. They see him. They learn about his authorities he teaches. They learn how he heals because he heals some, Peter's mother-in-law. He heals lepers. He heals the blind who come to him. He heals all kinds of people that you're able to see. He clears the temple once. He changes water to wine. He, they also understand his hometown doesn't like him. They don't get along with him at all. And by the time he chooses the 12, he, they know he heals lepers. He heals paralytics. They also know he calls himself Lord of the Sabbath. 
they also know he's defiant to some of the Pharisees and some of the traditions that they have set up and some of the judgments that they have made. Jesus simply will not follow along with that. They know he stands against them. They know he argues with them. And then they learn that he's bigger than we thought. He's not just a political person. They see him walk on water. They watch him still a storm. And they go, who is this guy? Because he controls nature. How did we get somebody who controls nature? And if you think about it, they're all there for a reason. They're there to be able to proclaim about Jesus. But their biggest question is, is he really Messiah? Is he really Son of God? Because every day they learn that his authority is bigger than what it was before. He says, follow me. And he has a reason for them because he sends them out to preach. He sends them out to heal. He sends them out to explain about his kingdom, of what the kingdom will be like. And I'm sure it comes out a lot different. He sends them out to proclaim his message. It's not just to gather people to come join a club. They are chosen together. If you think about it, he never just says, all right, I want that when you come and you follow me. It'll just be you and me. I think sometimes we would like that. Jesus chose me. I know all the rest of you are there too, but Jesus really chose me and he really loves me and he really likes the way I do things and the way I praise him and the way I sing and everybody else is really doing it wrong because you shouldn't sing that song. We ought to sing it faster. We ought to sing it slower. We ought to sing it lower or higher or something because all the rest of you are not doing it right. Jesus really loves me more than the rest. Not how he chooses. He chooses 12. And when he has special ones, it's three, Peter, James, and John. It's not just one. He never chooses just you. He always chooses us with someone else. When he sends them out, it's two by two. Or when he sends them out, it's two by two. But he sends 70 of them out, not just the 12. And so he always chooses in a group. We are part of each other. We're called to be part of a group. And so it's not just that he chose me and I'm special, it's that he chose us and we are special. Because that's who it is. He is so big and so huge and so incredible in the things that he's able to do and the things he's able to say. It's just amazing what God is able to do. And they got to watch him walk on earth. They got to watch him walk on water. They got to hear his teaching. But you know what? We've got the whole book. We have the whole story. They just saw him for one day, and then they had to show up again the next day to get the next part. And we've got the whole story for the whole thing. And so what I want you to look at to now is to share in with me in, in John chapter 6. There's an incident that happens as Jesus has been teaching where he feeds the 5,000. So in John 6, it says, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing the large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for, for each of them to get a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, and also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. And so they gathered them up, and they filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that it was done, they said, This indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. He does that so that people will know who he is. They don't get it till later. And so a lot of times you don't get appreciation while you're doing it. It's only later when they realize, Wow, that was good. 
that they finally say, okay, now I get why we did that. But sometimes in the heat of the moment when you're trying to do it, it, it just doesn't seem to get the appreciation or the thing that you need. But we do it anyway because we know that God blesses through that. We know that God, that's the way Jesus does things. And so Jesus kind of sets this up. He sees the large crowd. He already knows what he's going to do. And so he says to Philip, wow, where are we going to get bread? To, you know, how, how can we buy enough bread for this many? And Philip, I don't know if he seems to be doing the math in his head already. You know, it's kind of a misleading question. Really? You think about it, Jesus, would he ask a misleading question? Apparently so. He has no intention of buying any bread. But he says, you know, how would we ever provide? How would we buy enough bread for this many people? And Philip's, oh, no, we can't. We better, you know, send them away. We don't want them around. And Jesus is like, no, you give them something to eat. We, we don't have money. It's, you know, 200 denarii, and then all they're getting is one slice of bread and a fishtail, and that's about it. Uh, what else could we do? I mean, what he's saying is it's not in the budget. And most things die right there. I mean, if it's not in the budget, obviously we cannot do this. We cannot feed this many people. We cannot have this go on. And most things stop at that point. And I think Jesus makes that point here to say, you know what, I want you to think past where you are. I want you to think past the limitation that budget would do. I want you to think about what's possible for you. You give them something to eat. And so as you look at the passage and you look at what's going on with them, he's trying to say to them, here's what I want. Andrew seems to come up with, a solution, not really. I mean, he just says, I found a boy who's got lunch. I don't know why he knows about the boy. And it's always Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Do you ever get out of being the little brother? I mean, with a brother like Peter, I guess not. I guess you're always going to be known as, oh, that's Peter's brother. You know, that's the way it is. So... That really doesn't pose a solution, they don't think. But Jesus says something very important. I want you to have the people sit down. There's how many? Well, there's 5,000 men, and so probably at least 10,000, because they've got wives and kids and everybody else, so there could be as many as 15 or 20,000. Luke even says, I believe it is, to sit down by 50s. So this is crowd control. I thought we were disciples. I thought we were doing important things. Why can't we go out and heal somebody? You know, something big. Something that makes a big impression on people. He says, no, I want you to do crowd control. I want you to take that group way back there. Because they're rowdy. You know who sits back there. <laughs> they're the rowdy ones back there. So I want you to make sure that they sit down. Why is it so important to sit down? I don't know, but he says, I want you to have them sit down. Okay, they're going to sit down. And then he takes the loaves and he takes the fish and he begins to pass out. And so he passes them to people to hand out. And you're able to see this as they go and distribute. Now they're servants. Now they're the waiters and the waitresses. And so here they are passing out food. I thought we were going to do something important. Can't I preach? Can't somebody? No, now I'm passing out the food. And by the way, sit down over there. You've got, you know, how do you keep people seated? When you start at one end and, well, they've got food. Well, they've got food. Why can't our table go next? You've been in those kind of groups, right? You know, our table needs to go next. Uh, and everybody's ready to jump up and run out. No, sit down because he'll get here. Uh, just one of those things. I'm not sure if, and I've always seen this as he hands to his disciples and his disciples pass the food out. But if you look at the passage, it really says, and he passed out the food. He distributed to all as any. 
Really? There's one guy now? Is it just one guy or is it a bunch? I, not really sure. I've always seen it as, you know, well, the 12 are passing out, but maybe they're just doing the crowd control. No, you've got to sit here and you've got to wait until he, one guy, goes to all 10,000. Either way, it's going to be a problem, right? Because now all you're doing is crowd control. And then they get through with uh, food, and then he says, all right, I want you to pick up. Pick up? Yeah. And somehow they find baskets. I, this has always been, to me, the miracle of the baskets. I don't know where baskets came from, but somehow they got 12 baskets, and you realize the part of the fish you don't eat is the fins, because these were little fish, and they usually just put them on the fire, and you don't eat fish fins. You don't eat fish tails. So now you've got, what, bones spit out everywhere, and breadcrumbs, and, you know, once somebody's eaten all the peanut butter and jelly out of the middle of the sandwich, do you eat the crust after somebody else has already eaten the rest of it? I mean, only if you're dad, right? Mom's going to say, don't eat after them. But that's what they're doing. Now they're picking up all of this, and they've got 12 baskets after five or 10,000 people. This is incredible. Now they're just the garbage people. And that's what they're doing. And that's their role as disciple. I don't think we get that today. I think we think, no, I want to do the important job. And I only want to do one. I don't want to have to do the passing out. I don't want to have to do crowd control. And then I don't want to have to do cleanup. We ought to, we ought to say, you know, let's divide this up. Let's get Andrew to do all the cleanup. Let's get somebody who can, you know, somebody else do that part. No, if you're a disciple, you do whatever Jesus needs. That's really the point of it. Whatever Jesus needs. And it's going to be all kinds of different things. And you are in the middle of it because he needs you there with him doing it. It's his training time. Just like he was training Philip to test him. Can you think of how we could feed this many people? He's training disciples to, will you pick up breadcrumbs that have been chewed already? And what's the reason? They don't take them with them. Who's going to eat all that? So you've got a basket full of fish fins and already chewed bread. I'm surprised there's only 12 baskets. We probably got more than that after the cleanup last night. I mean, <laughs> there wasn't near 5,000, but there's, there's quite a few. There's a lot of people from our community came. And there's no reason for it. Why would we pick it up? Because I told you to. Yeah, those are the harder ones. We want people to volunteer for jobs that have no reason or point other than the fact that it shows your discipleship. That's a real hard sign-up list, isn't it? That's what it means to be chosen. And that's what it means to choose him. And that's the difference between them. We can all see ourselves as the chosen. God chose me. God chose me because I'm important. He wants to me to do something important. He has an important job for me to do. And we all see ourselves as the important ones. We don't see ourselves as, you know what, he just wants it done because we're good environmental people and we don't leave our trash everywhere. But we're not taking it with us. We're not going to eat it. We're just, we're just going to leave the baskets right, do it. Because it says something about who we are. That's us choosing him. He will be my Lord, because I'll do anything, he says. So he chooses us, but the other side of the question is, do we choose him? Do we choose to do whatever he says to us? Do we choose to do whatever it takes for us then? to be his disciples. Are the chosen ones the ones with the same doctrine? Do they have all the same ideas? 
There might have been Republicans and Democrats among the disciples. I don't know. There was at least zealots among them. I don't know. I don't know how that could ever get along, you know. But they all had different ideas, didn't they? They had a different idea about what kingdom was going to be. They thought it was for the overthrow of Rome. Whether some thought it was violent or not violent, at least Jesus is the next king, right? When you talk about kingdom, we're expecting you and us to be, what, cabinet level, secretary of something, secretary of Galilee, fish, I don't know, but something. And so they saw a different thing about this. All of them didn't really get it. Because the whole thing seems to be something that they weren't quite. And so you might say none of them really had the right doctrine of exactly what was supposed to happen there. Now, do we need to have correct doctrine? Well, sure we do. Are we all going to get it at the same time? Probably not. Because some of us have to learn. And some of us have to be taught. And some of us have to choose Jesus first. And then we grow as we learn how to do this. What? You're going to die? This isn't my plan. This isn't working out. And Peter is just adamant that this can't happen until Jesus calls him Satan. And then he goes around and washes feet. And Peter says, you're not washing my feet. You don't understand, Peter. This is our doctrine. This is our teaching. This is the way we do things. We pick up breadcrumbs and we wash feet. And it takes a while to get to those things. So they had difference in, the, in that as well. They didn't all come from the th same thing, but they were followers. Every miracle seems to have work to do behind it. If you want to see the miracle, be willing to do the work behind it. Be willing to pass out bread. Be willing to pick up fish fins. Be willing to do whatever it takes to make it all work. But I don't think the teamwork ever comes together until Pentecost. Because they're always still arguing about who's the greatest. But on Pentecost, they all stood together and they let one speak. There's no competition against each other. People saying this isn't the right way, this isn't the right thing. Jesus had them constantly doing things. Prepare a place for Passover. Let's be able to deal with this. Find me a donkey to ride into town. All of those things that were just little things. But Jesus also worked with failure. That may be one of the hardest things to deal with. He worked through failure already with them. Because you've got Judas. Judas. And as the rest grow more and more involved and more and more willing, Judas becomes less and less willing. And is there because, I mean, he's in the crowd, he's doing all the stuff. But he's really looking out for himself. And you know how those kind of organizations go. When you're really looking out for yourself, and he's out to make money, money seems to be most important, he's trying to be able to do that. And so... You realize most churches, that's the reason why people quit. When somebody embezzles the funds, when there's some kind of a problem going on, they decide, no, I don't want to be part of a church like that. And Jesus says, let me show you what that's like. The leader dies, there's been a murder among you, and it's of the leader. And then we learn the treasury is empty. And the guy who was the treasurer commits suicide. Would you join a group like that? I don't know that that's going to be such great press. But his other disciples knew that they believed. And they were a group together. And when someone's stealing the money, I just, that's just one of those things. I'm not sure we do that. They learned success in ministry with all the crowds. And they learned about failure in ministry with what was going on between them. Judas objected violently to the anointing that Joel talked about because he could have sold that and made money that he could have stolen. Boy, what a time. As you get to the end of John 6, you find an even greater turn down. 
In verse 66 it says, And after this many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, that we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? And he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. And it's when you realize church is about us acting like we should and doing what we should and participating like we should and being who we should regardless of the people that are around. Because there may be some right here who are not really trying to follow Jesus. They're really trying to do it for themselves. But boy, we sure don't want to make that kind of a judgment. We just want to be the ones who say, I know why I'm here, and I choose Jesus. Even when the crowd walks away, even when the crowd says, no, we don't want to do this anymore. Because he'd been trying to teach them about involvement. He'd been trying to teach them, you need to bring me close, you need to be with me. Like, like when you get food, you don't just leave the food, you eat the food. You bring it in, you ingest it, so it's like you would eat my body and my blood, and, and they're going, uh, that sounds like cannibalism, we don't like this picture. And so we're not going to do that. He says, no, I'm just trying to say you need to be involved with me. And his disciples get it. I don't know that they really understand the teaching, all of it. But they come back with, well, we know you have the words of eternal life. Whether we understand the words of eternal life or not, we know there is nowhere else to go. We know you have them. We choose you. Because he asked them, would you go away? And they said, we're not leaving. We're not going anywhere because we choose you, and that's what it means to be chosen. He chooses us, we choose him. Both sides have to happen like that. The teaching sometimes gets difficult. I've sat in Ashby's class before. All of those scholars, oh my goodness. Then you go to Josh's class, and it's, boy, there's so much psychology. I wonder if everybody knows about me in there. <laughs> You can find that in any class you want to go to. You go to Steve's class and you feel so dumb because he's got all this scientific stuff that he's talking about. And you're going, I don't even know that I understand the flood plates and all this kind of stuff and the shift. And... But we stay because we follow Jesus. We follow him. He is most important. Where would you go? I don't even if I don't quite get it all yet, I don't have anywhere else because I know Jesus is real. Jesus picked them and they followed. They were involved. They worked. And that's why I appreciate so much all of you who came last night and all of you who worked and all of you who saw the community that came out. I don't know. I'd say 300 at least just from around community plus all of you guys. There was a lot of people. You guys went through a lot of hamburgers. So... Thanks for all the work and the things that you've done because, boy, that's what makes a difference. All right, so let me illustrate. I've got three illustrations for how all this works. So when you pick something for your house, you want to pick something that fits, something that works, right? Something that makes a statement. So there's a chair that you would pick for your house. Obviously, this is Joshua's chair because it's bright orange. If you've seen his office. Uh, so you're going to pick something that fits, though, something that really is good. Why would you do that? Well, he chooses us because he wants us to fit with him. But he chooses us because of him, and not because we fit now, but because we will, and because we believe in him. It may look so odd at first, but after a while, you realize, yeah, that really goes. That's really the place where it all happens. And Jesus chooses us because of him. We choose a mate because, you know, I mean, out of all the thousands of men or women in the world, you chose the one that you chose, or maybe you're still looking. 
That says a lot if you're still looking because you think you can choose out of all the men and women in the world. That's not really true. You only get to choose out of the ones who would accept you. You don't get to choose out of all the ones in the world. I mean, come on, get realistic here. That isn't really the truth. It's not all the girls in the world. It's the girls who would go out with you. And so you choose from among those, and then you realize there's only one right one, and that is the one who would put up with me. So you're not even looking for the ones who would go out with you. You're looking for the one who would put up with you. And so you're going to choose the right one. And I think that makes all the difference. You choose them. They choose you back. And that's what makes a disciple. Adam didn't have much choice, did he? He had all the choice he needed. He had the right choice. This one is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Why would I need another one? I choose you. And she chose him. If you don't go through that process, you don't really have that strong a bond. You have to be able to choose. We choose a child from the time he's born. It happens automatically for moms, less for dads. But we decide, I choose you. You're my child. My first one was pretty ugly. Just, you know, all swollen and messy, and it's like, all right, that's fine. We'll, we'll take him. <laughs> but you really have to choose him. Otherwise, you're looking around. Have you got a better one over there? You know, can I, can I trade? You want to? <laughs> that's not really, you have to be able to choose and say, this one is mine through everything through all the things that they pull, through all the good behavior, bad behavior. And you know what? They choose you. You're my mom. You're my dad. Hopefully they aren't picking some. Now they can. I mean, they can rebel and say, I don't want to be part of this family. I don't want to have anything to do with you guys. That usually comes a little bit later. But we choose each other. And if you don't do that with children, you need to do that with children because that's my child, my responsibility, my place, my behavior, my work, my effort goes into that child. And everything that child needs, just like everything my Lord needs, goes into that effort. And so when you think about it, that seems to be the way in which we do. We don't need a whole bunch of people to choose from. We choose prodigal son. He does not allow his father to choose him. He says, I want my inheritance. Sorry, old man. I don't want you. And that's what dad knew. I don't want you. I just want your money. And oddly enough, dad said, okay. The older brother is there as well. He doesn't choose dad either. He says, I'll just let it ride, but I'm just here for the money. You see that later on. He's pretty upset that the younger son left and got his already. When the younger son comes back, he comes to himself. He says, I will repent. I did something wrong. I will choose my father. And he goes back to his father again to choose him. His father runs and chooses his son again. And now they have that bond because they have chosen each other. The older brother still has not chosen the father. I'm not going to that party with that son of yours. He's not my brother. He's that son of yours. It works the same way with you. You see, we come to the point where we realize our own sin. We don't have the way of life to be able to make it all happen. We're not that smart. We're not that good. And sometimes we have to get in some pretty big failure before we ever realize it. But at some point in our life, we realize, I can't do this myself, and I need 
my Father, and so we come back to him. He's always been there to choose us as long as we will choose him, as long as we will let him choose us, but sometimes we just don't let him. And so we come to ourselves, we come back to him, and we say, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against you, Father. And we sin against God. And we do exactly the same process. And we come back to him, and he says, I've got a great feast. Except for we're not killing the fatted calf. I've killed Jesus, my other son. Come in and rejoice because the son of mine was lost and is found. He was dead. He's alive. Did you choose God? There's a lot of choices you have. He wants to choose you so much. Have you chosen God? We do it by our repentance and our baptism into him because Jesus has died on a cross so that we're able to be there. Choose him today. Be one of his chosen. Come while we stand and sing.